Hi, welcome back, everyone. Today, we want to talk about software security. This is the beginning of our module two. Um, and we'll begin just to dive right into stack buffer overflow. And this is so, so, so important that I want every one of you to be intimate, familiar with how it works, how can it be done, how it is possible, how to prevent this. We're gonna have a programming assignment coming up real soon. And so uh, this week, uh, watch out for it. Um, and it will be relatively straightforward in the sense that um, we, have, we give you a lot of in instructions um, in the programming assignment description, you will also have our TAs uh, um, being there to help you. Um, a very important paper is Smashing the Stack for Fun and the Profit. This was written back in the 90s, I believe, um, describing how stack can be abused. Uh, to direct control flow, the execution of the program into attacker's code. So very, very important to please read it. The um, programming assignment uh, description would also um, have information about this paper. Just a little bit of a background um, program. Programs sometimes just do things. Okay, and, and sometimes it's just an um, inadvertent flaw, you know, programmers' mistakes when they write code, you know, API means uses that leads to uh, issues. Um, and sometimes it's intentional. Some employees, before they got laid off and they embed some backdoors and, and time bombs in their program. Um, and regardless, they, they may create issues that enable attackers to abuse a program, leak information, execute malicious code. Um, buffer overflow was not, is, has been around for a long, long time. 1988, that was uh, Morris Worm that started, um, which has many different components in it. Um, one of it is buffer overflow in the, this uh, finger demon. Finger is a program, it was disabled while I was in grad school, I think um, like 10 years ago, um, more than 10 years ago. And, and it was, it was um, a server, it's a demon, it's a server, it's a, it'll keep running. Um, it allow you to say, to find out who is on the server, who is, on the, uh, who is active. Um, uh, logging onto the server. Um, and, and that program, that server program has numerous vulnerable function calls, a string copy, unsafe, scan, um, printf, string concatenation, all of them are unsafe. There's no boundary check. And then so, so you can copy a really big thing into a really small buffer and end up flooding the, flooding the buffer, which will explain how, why, it's, why it's bad. Morris Worm also had uh, dictionary attacks uh, um, because at that time, password hashes are stored in a public file. And right now, if you look at the default Linux, uh, it's, it's, it's the password hash values it is not publicly available, only available by root. Um, and, and so if you have the hash file, then you can try different um, guesses and then see whether the hash matches. If it matches, it must be the same one. And then hash is, can, can be computed super quickly. And it's, it, it's called the worm because Maurice Mauer get in touch with other servers, finger demons, and, and then you know, spread itself. Um, Cause a lot of damage. Um, there's articles about it, um, and, and so read about it if you have time. Um, go back to stack. Go back to stack. But you know, first of all, process memory. What, what is process memory? Um, in just a little bit of recap, for a program, 
to run in the operating system, you know, it's a running, it's a process, it needs some space to run, okay? It, it needs to have uh, its instructions, it's a code, it's called text region, code region, it's read only, um, has all the instructions laid out, has a, uh, a space for data, um, if it's array, that's initialized the data, if it's a, like link list, uh, malloc, those kind of data structure is un initialize the data and then it has stack stack is um last in first out um because it manages function cost a cost b b cost c and then when c returns c return back to b and b gets popped b ends and then b return back to a so it's last in first out right um because it manages all the subroutine uh, invocation. So, so um, nothing really fancy about it. It's just a data structure. It's um, sort of memory region that that allow one to um, complete those subroutine calls. And then because when you do subroutine calls, there's arguments you pass in, return an address. You have to know where to return, and so all, all these bookkeeping information. So, so it's not very difficult to understand. Um, and it's not supposed to execute code. Okay, stack is not supposed to have instructions on it. Um, and so, but then for a long time, stack allow instructions to appear and allow um, operating system to actually execute uh, portions of stack as if it's a text region. And so nowadays the stack has this uh, no execution um, protection enabled by default. And so so all these attacks that we talked about is no longer working in current operating system Linux and Windows because stack right now cannot allow execution. But um, for our understanding purpose, so we do assume that it's, it's still the case and then you can turn it off. There's a flag that allows you to turn off this protection. Um, so you can still experience buffer overflow attacks. A little bit more definitions. Control flow, what does it mean? It's, it just refers to the order of execution. Um, and a program uh, has a specific order, you know. Um, and, and so if this order is disrupted, um, people say it's the violates the integrity of control flow. Um, and, and the attacker may be able to redirect uh, the, the execution to somewhere else, um, may, maybe to attackers injected code, or in the order that is really not intended by the original program. Um, so, so there is a, um, a called, what is it called, a code? reuse attack that allow attackers to, to jumping around uh, in the legitimate program and then put together an uh, execution that is malicious. Um, so today we talked about the injected code. Injected code where uh, the code wasn't a part of the original victim computer, but it was injected by the attacker and then gets executed. Uh, how a little bit more definition. Um, sometimes you see different names about stack. Control stack, execution stack, they're all the same thing. And the stack has different bookkeeping um, components. Um, there's a stack pointer that refers to the memory location uh, of the top of the stack, and that allow you to do subtraction. And so, so you know, it, um, when you subtract, that means you allocate space on the stack. Um, you know, you may ask why subtract, not addition. It's just how the layout works. Um, and so, but, but there's, you know, stack frame refer to the whole stack space. Um, and stack buffer overflow, and buffer overflow can appear on stack or on heap. For uh, stack, it, you know, a lot of times that is where variables gets writ overwritten um, with too much information that exceeds the, the original intended boundary. Um, and so buffer overflow, and, and it's, it's that's the, the name, um, how it goes. And, and so, so, so he, let's look at a simple example. Um, let's, I want you to direct your attention to this 
code, which is very simple, your main function that only have one subroutine, uh, and this routine costs uh, with three arguments, but never use ABC. Uh, all it does is allocate two buffers, okay? And so there, there's no vulnerability in this simple example, but I want to show that you can actually predict the layout of stack with very good accuracy. And so the, the, this is what the stack looked like at the end of the, um, this line, at the, at the end of line three. Right, the stack, the way to look at it is sort of tilt your head a little bit, okay? So, so here the left is the top of the stack we said is, is um, you, you push things down to the stack and then last in first out. So um, when function one, two, three gets caught, um, the operating system will first allocate, okay, what do we see here? We see three arguments going into the subroutine. So therefore we allocate space for the three arguments. Okay? So ABC, ABC, and then we have the return address. You always, you always allocate the return address right after the arguments four bytes in the 32-bit architecture, and then save the frame pointer, and this is for bookkeeping information. And the next one is local variables of this subroutine. We, we see buffer one and buffer two, okay? So a little bit more, more details. Uh, buffer one, and, and so what you see is that, again, you first allocate the arguments of the subroutine, and then the return address, in the 32-bit architecture, everything is four bytes, multiples of four. That's where the return address is. The return address memorize, memorize this point, okay, right after six, line seven, so that when function uh, subroutine call is complete, the operating system knows where to come back, to where to come back. It goes to uh, the end of main function. Uh, save the frame pointer. But for one in this case, see, you see that even though it's a size of a five byte, but it, but it allocated the width eight bytes because everything has to be multiples of four. And similarly, for buffer two, you uh, allocate 12 bytes. So this is a very simple example, but then it shows that you can very accurately guess and calculate the stack layout. You know where everything is. You know, you know pretty much the exact location where buffer two is, the starting address of it, you know, relative to the beginning of the stack. So why is this important? Why, what, and why is this bad? Why is um, calculating stack layout is bad? Well, first of all, you only be able to calculate when there's no fine-grained address space layout randomization. There's no randomization of the stack. And, and the ASLR is a modern protection, um, which is uh, enabled almost by default for pretty much all modern operating systems. Um, and, and so you won't be able to do this uh, type of calculation anymore currently, but if you don't have ASLR enabled, uh, you can do it. Well, it's useful you know, calculating stack layout is useful because you can calculate where the beginning of the buffer is, okay? And because you will need, a, you know, as an attacker, you will need to redirect uh, the return address and you know, the control flow into the beginning of the buffer where you want to store attack code. So we'll, we'll see that uh, pretty soon. So, but uh, a, a bit more information more examples, so here you have a slightly more complicated uh, cause. Main function calls full, full allocate some integers and calls bar. Um, and so again, you, you know, because first in, last out, and so the stack and, and 
you know, let's look at this, where this is the top of the stack now. And then so you are forced to push down the main stack frame for the main function. And then when you come across the full, you allocate um, the argument, a return address, local variables. Okay, so, so, so you, the full has line seven and line eight allocates to uh, local variables. And this is where they are, okay, right after a return address. And then you see, okay, it, it calls a bar and then you know, argument, return address, local variables. It's, it's always like this. And then when this is done, when bar is done executed, it will follow this return address and then go back to full. And then when full is done, you go back to the main function. So the return address is extremely important because it directs the control flow to the right place. Right? So you know where, what to execute next. And if you're directing the control flow to the wrong place, then you may end up executing attacker's code. Um, and so what did this, what did, what did this mess? Um, this is assembly code. Assembly code, of course, is not human readable. It's not intended to be um, routinely read by human, although in earlier times, um, some of the code is written at the assembly level. And, and then that's, of course, it's a tremendous um, amount of stress so for developers and also Aaron Pro. Um, so this is the, the assembly code version of the previous example. And you can see, um, kind of you can kind of figure out what's going on here you know uh, you allocate you allocate something you push things onto the stack you pop uh, and then you call some functions and you call functions so you don't have to of course understand um assembly code in a way that you know you you sort of immediately know oh this line is about you know allocating a local variable you don't have to do it you only need to know that it's actually almost line by line directly corresponding to the the c code um, um and then every assembly uh, uh code can be converted into instruction that's a uh, Hexo, hexadecimal encoding of the instruction that the machine uh, instructions. And, and so uh, when you do stack buffer overflow attacks, you, you cannot give them C code. You cannot give buffer C code. It has to be instructions that uh, uh, has to be executed. Um, so here is another buffer overflow example. And uh, here is a uh, what previously is just a regular example, there's no overflow, but here is actually an overflow example. Not those, not very bad, not very bad. There's, there's no vulnerability. There's only, um, you know, you will get segmentation fault. So let's see, a main function causes a subroutine. Causes a subroutine with a very large string, 256 A's. And then see in the subroutine, allocate a really small buffer. And then this big, big string is squeezed into this small buffer. And so what ends up happening is that you have a stack that lay out like this, right? So by the time that line nine is executed, the function is caught, you have, okay, the argument, of the subroutine right, of string, return address, a same frame pointer, and then 16 byte buffer. And, and this is not to, it's not, not, proportion, not proportionate to the size, okay? So, but the buffer is 16 byte. So, so this is a, the layout. And then once it actually gets, uh, when the line three gets executed, what will happen? What does the, the stack look like? What does the buffer look like? When line three gets executed, where you have this 256 of A's gets copied, in, copied into this small buffer of 16 bytes. One A is one byte. So everything is flooded with A's. Right, including the return address, right? So when you have return address written with all A's, 
what will happen? Well, it's not a return address. It's not a real return. You're supposed to return to line 10 and whatever that memory address is. And AAAA in the hexadecimal encoding is this, 0x414141. It may or may not point to a text region, may not be a valid instruction. Right, so that point to a memory address and that address may not contain a, a valid instruction and you are trying to interpret that address value as if it's an uh, instruction and, and, and if it's not, then you get segmentation flawed. Um, so what happened is that the buffer will all flooded with A's. Look like this, right? So, so this is not good. This is obviously not good, but it's actually not that bad, right? So it's the attacker, it's not very useful for attacker. You, you get segmentation for, um, you are not executing attack code. So, so uh, you know, try this at home. And this is another example where you can type in something. So, um, so let's see what's going on here. So you have a main function that's infinitely a uh, loop, uh, has an infinite loop that uh, execute foo and the foo ask the user to type in something uh, after allocating a really small buffer, or oh, buffer of size five. So, and then it will output what you type, what you type and also what's inside the buffer. Okay, so so try this at home and make sure that when you compile, compile this with this uh, flag that turn off the stack protector so that the stack uh, can get overflowed. So try this at home. And that, that is a very straightforward buffer overflow example, but then the attacker thinks, okay, how, how, how can I use this to do something really useful for me for an attacker, right? Flooding a buffer with A's, with some random strings to cause segmentation fault may not be very useful. How can I make it useful? What should I flood the buffer with? Okay, so the simplest way to make a buffer stack buffer overflow attack useful is to inject the buffer with a, what is it called shell code. Shell code by its name is very simple. It's a code that uh, starts a shell, and hopefully it's a, it's a root shell. Um, if the process is actually the victim process, victim program is executing with a root privilege, then the shell will naturally uh, has a, the root. Privilege, and so so you you call this system call exe cve um, with the argument of a shell uh, uh, name and some uh, required arguments. In this case, it's just now. So I mean, this is a C code you cannot inject it into a buffer directly. So attacker does it is to inject the, the actual instructions. And so this is corresponding, this is, if you see, um, um, they, they map to each other. Okay, so this is, um, but then there is some select, slash uh, difficulties. See, so you cannot just uh, compile it together assembly code and then you, convert this uh, into instruction. There, there are some little tricks you do have to do. Uh, for our programming assignment, you don't have to worry about this. This code is given to you. You can just copy and paste, and then you have to, all you need to do is to structure the buffer um, so that uh, it, it uh, incorporate the shell code, also override the return address. But I will to explain what's going on in the shell code. Um, um, so that you know that it's actually not that intimidating. Um, and this is the assembly version of the shell code. Um, again, you don't have to like jump into understanding this. Uh, we just want to uh, step this down so that um, you know the basic structure of shell code. Um, 
all the, all the, all the assembly code start with this sort of prelude um, and begin by allocate the argument, space for the argument. And you see subtraction sub L, that's the um, allocation, memory allocation. And because the stack, um, the way stack um, grows is um, with, uh, uh, with, with a smaller memory address. So, so you know, whenever you see allo uh, subtraction, that's actually memory allocation. Um, and then there are two arguments, right? So one is a string, the other is a null. So you, you want to move those information somewhere. Um, and you push the arguments onto uh, the stack in preparation for this exe call, right? So that, that is a function call. That's a system, system call. Um, so it, you push that to the stack. Um, you push the argument to the stack. Um, and, and so pretty much everything else is just in preparation for that call. Um, um, and, and, and there's, you know, um, you load the, the address of the string. Um, and then when, you, when everything is prepared, you make the call. You, you say, you know, you, you, and, and you can see here, there is a, is there's a call. That means you execute the system call and this is a system call's name. Um, and then what happened in that system call, EXECR, EXECBE. Um, so this is assembly code. This is assembly code corresponding to this, this one line here. Okay, this one line. Um, um, and so, so you um, copy the, the um, arguments that this call needed um, onto the stack, and then you change into the kernel mode. The one you execute system calls has to be in the uh, kernel mode. And so this is where this interruption is, inter interrupt AD that's switching to the kernel mode so that you can execute the system call. Um, so that, that's, that's pretty much it uh, for, for the shell code. Okay, the shell code, but the shell code by itself is just a part of the attack. Um, you have to, the shell code, even though it's in the buffer, it has to be executed, right? So you have to direct the control flow to the shell code. Otherwise, the shell code will just be uh, sitting there. Um, and so, so how, how do you direct the control flow, the order of execution to the beginning of the shell code? Right, so you, you have to know the beginning of the shell code. And then you have to get that address and then put it into the return address. So instead of return back to the original callee, original caller, original caller, right? So the intended uh, return position, you redirect the, the return execution into the beginning of your shell code. So this is the point that I want to um, I want to switch to my other screen with a whiteboard. Um, and so this become very interesting. I want to um, draw a little bit um, to just to illustrate how the how the stack, the layout of the stack, when you have this um, when you have this shell code. Okay, so a little bit more uh, intuition. So you have, this is the victim, victims program process. Victims process, um, you know, victims of stack, stack. Um, 
a victim's process. Okay. And somewhere the you know you have this buffer. Okay. But this is all victim stack, victims buffer, victims return address. Um, and and there there are places. Those are the legitimate instructions on the victims process, the tax region, okay, instructions where this points to, okay, so in a normal situation, you have a regular buffer, there's no over flooding and you, you rewrite, you, you copy this with some, you know, some A's and B's, whatever, and then it stops at the boundary um, when everything is done, you return to the intended place. And then you start executing one um, down the, the instruction, okay, as, as you're supposed to do. But here with where the buffer overflow situation, everything is filled out with a shell code. Let's use this to say, okay, you, we know that you can flood a buffer, a vulnerable buffer with shell code. Um, and uh, shell code, you know, it's the shell code is not that big. And so sometimes it's, it, it really can fit in. And you can overwrite the uh, saved stack frame. Um, and so, but then it has to be, executed otherwise there's no good right and so the attacker really need to do what does the attacker need to do instead of return everything to the, the correct place they have to direct the execution to the beginning of the buffer so so the attacker need to know the address suppose the address is oxd8 Right. So the attacker really need to to overwrite the return address with a new address, and then that new address is the beginning of the shell code. Right. This is a new new address, new return address. That points to the beginning of the shell code. So what does the attacker need to know? The attacker need to have a, a, a small buffer that there's no boundary checking and then there's this vulnerable function, a string copy and so on that allow them to um, um, inject information and the program also take information from attacker from outside, say, you know, give me some input. And so in, be able to do this and then inject into the small buffer and then be able to guess the new return address and then overwrite the old return address with a new one. That's a lot of work, would you say? There's a lot of work. And then you have to, what if you miscalculated and, and then you just off by one, by four bytes and, and then everything will not work out. Um, so, so attacker um, indeed has has that problem that this is something that um, not very easy to pull off and you do have to be very careful. Um, so so there are some tricks that attacker can do. Okay. Some tricks that increase the chance of success in the attack. Okay. Um, I'm going to illustrate a little bit more, um, and in the, the, the paper has more information um, for our programming assign, assignment. You don't have to, you, you only have to implement no op sled, uh, multiple copies of return address and last two, I believe. Everything else is, is um, um, already as part of the, the uh, shell code. So, so you have to exit gracefully in, in a way that does not trigger uh, program crash and so on. So people add attacker add would that want to add uh, add the zero, um, um, so that they can exit gracefully. Um, remove null character. Null character is very tricky because see in a string, if a string has a null character in it, it will end. 
um, if that's that because that's the conventionally indicate the end of string. Um, but then you see all kinds of nulls because that uh, system call require now as a, a part of the argument. And so they replace it with X or, and so that it's essentially it's a now X or the same thing. It's we give you now, but then the now does not appear as, as it is. Jump call is a trick that you use to uh, compute the um, relative, relative addressing so that you don't have to know the ab absolute address. Um, and this is slightly more involved because you have to know the address of where slash bin slash sh is stored. Um, and jump call allow you to, because it, it's pop the address onto the stack and then at the time you grab it and, and then you can calculate it back. Um, but I want to explain a little bit more, little bit more about no op sled and the multiple copies of return address. Um, because that's uh, relatively intuitive. And so what happened is that, let me stop sharing here and go back to the whiteboard. So, um, so we have, we have this situation. Okay, we have the situation, what happened? We want to have, what if, you uh, miscalculate it, okay? So what if you miscalculated, you thought that this is, you saw this is a return address. Um, and, and then you are off, okay? So you are actually, you know, you, if that, this is a case, then, then you're, you're not doing anything because the return address is still the old return address, okay? Um, and, and, the, and everything, by the way, has to be a long, big string that you feed into the vulnerable program, right? So, so we're, we're talking about this long, big string that you feed into the vulnerable, vulnerable program has shell code. It also has other things. And those other things, one of it is a new return address. But then if you, if you are off by four bytes, this is no good. And so what happened is that you just simply, so this is the point into the, you just simply uh, put in your buffer multiple copies of the new return address. Okay, so, so um, again, you want to copy really big things into a small buffer, right? Into a small buffer and then because you know the layout, the buffer, once it gets written in there, it will just keep going um, on, on, the, on the stack and overwriting everything else. Um, and so, in, in, in this is what really happened. And, and suppose that you don't need this much space for the shell code and this, the end of this can also be, can also be the, the new return address. So there's a multiple return address. Um, and so, you, you may ask, okay, how can I know the new return address? Um, this is for our programming assignment. You can use debugger, you can manually inspect the stack, and then you get whatever uh, um, address that you need. Uh, sometimes you sort of have to do trial and error. You, you guess a little bit. Uh, if this one doesn't work out to give you segmentation fault, maybe you plus four, you know, minus four. Um, sometimes if you use, use debugger um, and without use debugger, it, it's, you know, GDB, it, it, uh, the address off a little bit, but, but you will be able to reasonably figure this out. Um, for actual attack, this is slightly more difficult because you will not have be able to do trial and error, but then think of this way. If you know the exact machine and operating system, the configuration of the big team, then you can replicate it at home. And then once you figure it out, the value, the return address, you launch it on the victim machine, it's gonna be uh, the same, oh, it, it should work. And then in reality, it's the last time that's, that's what an attacker does. You, you obviously don't want to test on the victim's computer because they will notice, you know, things keep crashing. Um, and so you test on your own computer. Um, 
But in reality, it's, it's uh, still going to be tricky, right? So how do you know what kind of operating system, what kind of, um, in a reconnaissance, it may not be that, that easy. So that's, that's it, multiple copy. And, and sometimes you may like write over it, which is fine, which is completely fine because you don't worry about here anymore because by the time you, the program execute here, it's already directing everything to the shell code, to the beginning of shell code. Everything um, afterwards, it, it doesn't really matter anymore. Okay, so what is no op sled? So we just talk about that is the um, um, multiple copies of each another. Copies of return address. This is a new new return address. Um, and another is no up sled. And I apologize about my handwriting. Look horrible. Um, no up sled. Again, this is for increasing the chance of attack success. Um, and so what if you, you know, you have this carefully prepared shell code that was exit gracefully and then call jump just to get a relative addressing so you have everything in place um, and multiple return address. What if the return address is wrong? Okay, so what if the return address is, uh, um, you are supposed to point here, but you're actually pointing, say, um, you're, you're actually pointing here. Oh, uh, well, let's, let's change it to, to um, let's, Okay, so, so say, um, you know, you're, you're maybe pointing here, pointing here. Okay, I mean, you want to point it here. So, so, so that's no good. You have to point to the beginning of the shell code, right? Um, I, I don't think the, the, the computer would understand how things, like the things would not work if you just, you know, go right in the middle of some code. So, so this is not very good. And, and, and what if you just, you are afraid that you may not be able to precisely predict the beginning of the buffer. And in this case, uh, what you do is that's assume that you have enough space, the buffer have enough space so, um, for the shell code. You just do some um, you just do some no op, no op. I mean no op does nothing, right? So it's called no op sled, and then after this, you do you add your shell code, and then you have you know anywhere you point, you'll be fine, and you know, like really it doesn't really matter because it just slide into the shell code. And so this is called no op sled, um, that just to give you some of the buffer zone so that you don't have to precisely estimate the the beginning of the buffer. And again, this value is what you need to write into this address. That's the key, the return address. The new return address is the key. And, and this is all packaged into one long buffer. Um, and then you feed into the victim's computer, victim's program. If the victim does not have a mechanism to take those kind of external input, what can you do? Well, you cannot do anything because if the program just run on its own, like you know, doing 
infinite number of additions of factorization, you know, things on its own, that, then it, it is actually pretty secure, okay? The victim's program need to take external input and then copy it into its internal memory. That is a chance where you may launch this type of attack. If it is just a completely isolated, it, the attacker won't be able to impact it. All right, so um, so hopefully this this makes sense to you, um, and and it will um, you'll be able to read the uh, um, the uh, the paper uh, a left one's paper and then have more information and then when you have to to do the hands-on exercise it's just an extremely uh, useful exercise and we have other exercises coming out and so we want to move this quickly forward um defense against buffer overflow we, we just want to go over them quickly hopefully we have more time to talk about this next class Non-executable stacks. This is a no-brainer. If you have a stack, his job is to maintain the arguments and you know return address. There's no need to execute anything on a stack. Uh, canaries, canary is where you put a secret value right before the return address, um, so that if it's overwritten, then you know your return address is no good. Um, canary is a kind of bird that. Um, coal miners that took to uh, down the coal mine um the bird is very sensitive the bird passed out and then then you know escape um so um you know the, the gas um the under underground the coal mine you really have you know carbon monoxide and something um address randomization you know stack buffer overflow is made possible because that attackers will be able to know precisely the layout of the stack, which is also not very necessary, um, and have some um, random layout so that attacker won't be able to guess. They can guess it's still going to be uh, very costly, is very necessary. Um, boundary attacking from the compiler. Right? Java has no, the, no buffer overflow vulnerability because the compiler does this type of checking. It's a safe language. Um, and but of course the Java JVM is written in C and, and it may be still susceptible to buffer overflow attacks. Um, but so multiple kind multiple protections, buffer overflow on stack is pretty much done. And that's that's uh, pretty much done unless you're talking about like legacy system. You know, like people report that a lot of weapon system runs very old code that on old system that full of this kind of vulnerabilities. But in consumer electronics, this is pretty much solved. But there's also heap overflow. There's other type of attack that has similar flavor, similar flavors um, that just repeats itself again and again. Um, one of the biggest thing, we mentioned this before, is make sure you validate inputs that you obtain from untrusted data sources, right? So, so if the attacker won't be able to influence the, the program or won't be able to influence directly, right? The attacker can, can, can um, have input, but then the program needs to make sure that it's a good input. Only when it's a good input, a good size, good format, then you can take it. Otherwise, we, we don't take it. Just don't take it as it is. Very important, very, very important, especially for web applications. If you get a job and you're supposed to, to uh, write web applications, make sure that you double check all these untrusted um, data sources. Okay. And if you, if you don't write code on yourself, if you're like a manager or something, make sure you ask are we validating input from untrusted data sources? Okay, and, and so this is just extremely common mistakes. Um, okay, I think, I think that's it. I want to stop here and look out for the programming assignment I'll definitely announce and then we'll continue the discussion about um, the software insecurity next class. 
Um, another reminder, please start thinking about your class project. I'm thinking of uh, uh, putting up the assignment um, for a class project proposal. It's going to be very short of one paragraph with a title, but you will, and you will have plenty of time to submit it, but start thinking uh, what to do. All right, that's it for today. Thank you, everyone. Bye. I don't know.